I'm here to talk about success. The first rule of success is to have a vision. You see, if you don't have a vision of where you go, and if you don't have a goal where you go, you drift around and you never end up anywhere. So I was very fortunate that I stumbled onto my vision. I mean, as you know, I was born in 1947 in Austria after the Second World War. And I didn't really like Austria when I grew up. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I couldn't see myself becoming a farmer or a worker in a factory or anything like that. My vision was totally different. I felt that I was born for something special, for something unique, for something big. So I was searching. Then one day I went to school. I remember I was 11 years old. And they showed a documentary about America. There they showed in this documentary the huge skyscrapers, the high rises, the huge bridges, the six lane freeways, and all of this stuff. And I said to myself, that's where I want to be. I don't want to be around here with these little farmhouses and these little buildings and everything is old. I want to be in America. But now the question was just how do you get to America? In those days, it was a very expensive trip. It's not like today. So again, very fortunate. I was very fortunate that one day after school, I walked by a store in Graz, which was called Brühl. And it was the only store that really sold kind of American stuff. So one day, they had jeans there, American jeans. And then they had the pool walker. And then they had an expander and some barbells and some dumbbells and an exercise bench in a window. So I went inside and I looked around and I looked at this stuff and then I saw a magazine. I saw a bodybuilding magazine that had Reg Park on the cover. Reg Park was then a three-time Mr. Universe. And I saw him on the big screen as Hercules. And on the cover it said, how Reg Park, Mr. Universe, became the Hercules star. That's what the cover story was all about. So I looked at the cover and I said to myself, I got to get this magazine. So I bought the magazine, I took it home and I read it over and over from the front page to the back. It had everything in there, how he trained, how he was working out in Leeds, England, in a factory town, how he worked out every day for three, four hours and became the strongest man of Europe and how he won Mr. Europe, Mr. Great Britain, and then eventually Mr. Universe. And how he won the second Mr. Universe and the third Mr. Universe. And how he was discovered to play the starring role in Hercules. I read that and I said to myself, wow, this is the blueprint for my life. This is exactly what I want to do. I want to become a bodybuilding champion, just like Reg Park. I want to get into movies, just like Reg Park. And I want to make millions of dollars and be rich and famous, just like Reg Park. Do you know how great it felt that I knew where I was going? Imagine the majority of people don't know where they're going. I knew where I was going. That I'm going to become this bodybuilding champion just like him. Because when you have a goal, when you have a vision, everything becomes easy. 74% hate their job in America. Now, this is not much different when you come to Europe. The majority of people don't like what they're doing because they're really not doing it because they didn't have a goal and they followed this goal. They just aimlessly drift around and then all of a sudden they, there's a job opening so they get that job because you have to work. But then when you work, it's a chore. It's work. It's not fun. So if you think about only a quarter of the people really enjoy what they're doing in life, that is unbelievable if you think about it. So I felt so blessed that I knew what I was doing. 
It's like a medical student that studies and knows he wants to become a doctor. You know where to go. So I knew where to go. So people always ask me, when they saw me in the gym in the pumping iron days, they said, why is it that you're working out so hard? Five hours a day, six hours a day, and you have always a smile on your face. The others are working out just as hard as you do, and they look sour in the face. Why is that? And I told people all the time, I said, because to me, I'm shooting for a goal. In front of me is the Mr. Universe title. So every rep that I do gets me closer to accomplishing that goal, to make this goal, this vision turn into reality. Every single set that I do, every repetition, every weight that I lift will get me a step closer to turn this goal into reality. So I couldn't wait to do another 500 pound squat. I couldn't wait to do another 500 pound bench press. I couldn't wait to do another 2,000 reps of sit-ups. I couldn't wait for the next exercise, for the next half hour of posing and all the kind of things that you have to do to be a champion. I felt so great knowing where I was going and I tell you it worked. I mean think about it and and I was just not visualizing just my exercise but I was really lifting the trophy over my head. That's what I was thinking about. And with the age of 20 with the age of 20 I went to London and I won the Mr. Universe contest as the youngest Mr. Universe ever. And it was because I had a goal. And this is no different than anything else, what I'm talking about. This is not just about bodybuilding. It was the same in acting. I remember when I was doing Conan the Barbarian. I was crawling on the rocks with a sword in my arm, crawling on all four. And of course, being that it's Conan, I didn't have clothes on or anything like that, right? So it was kind of my knees were bare, my elbows were bare and everything like this. And I'm crawling on the rocks. So after 10 takes, my elbows were bleeding and my knees were bleeding. And the director came to me and he said, Arnold, I'm so sorry that you have to go through this, but we need one more take. A close-up of you crawling with the sword towards the camera. Can you handle one more take? And I said to him, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, I'm totally fine. He says, but you're bleeding. I said, because I don't feel it because I can visualize what the scene will look like in a film. And I'm so excited about this scene. And so I had this in my mind. And so this is why it didn't matter if I had to do another 50 takes or 100 takes, no matter how much I bleed on my elbows or my knees, I saw that vision of the perfect scene and it was an important scene and I would do it over and over again until we got it. And the same thing is also in politics. I remember that in politics I had a very clear vision that I will be the leader of California. That's as far as I could go because I was not born in America so I could not run for president. So being the governor of the fifth largest state of, I should say the largest state, the fifth largest economy in the world was for me really the ultimate title, the ultimate accomplishment in politics. So even though people came up to me and said, why don't you go and run for something smaller, you're never going to make it. I ran for governor and then two months later I became governor of the state of California. Again, because I had a very clear vision what I'm going to do with California. So let me tell you something, visualizing your goal and going after it makes it fun. You got to have a purpose no matter what you do in life. You got to have a purpose. Now I said to the agent, the Hollywood agent, I want to get into movies. He said, <laughs> that's funny, Arnold. I ask a studio executive, I say, I want to get into movies. I want to be a leading man. He started laughing. So they all said, it's impossible. I said, why is it impossible? He says, because look at how big you are. 
You weigh 250 pounds. And then they told me this, and your accent, even if you reduce all your body weight and everything and have a normal body, your accent. I said, your accent, I mean, it will go give people goosebumps with the German accent. It will get people the creeps. They will get scared. He says, no one in Hollywood ever has become a leading man that had an accent. It doesn't happen. People in America want to hear their actors talk like John Wayne or like Burt Reynolds or like Clint Eastwood. Not like someone on Hogan's Heroes or something like that. Some Nazi movie. This is the kind of stuff that they heard. They said, no, you see, it's impossible. And plus your name, your name who can pronounce Schwarzen Schnitzel or something like that. No one can pronounce that, so forget about it, Arnold. This is the kind of thing that I heard. Imagine, you go from studio executive to studio executive, from agent to agent, from manager to manager, and they all said exactly the same thing. Now that's very encouraging, isn't it? But you know something? I didn't give a shit. And of course I went to college to study English. I studied the I studied voice accent removal, acting classes, and all of this stuff, all day long. I worked and I worked and I worked. And within a short period of time, I made one movie called Hercules in New York, which of course went right into the toilet. But it didn't discourage me. I still had the same vision. And then all of a sudden I did Streets of San Francisco. I did Stay Hungry and Pumping Iron and The Villain. And then all of a sudden I was asked by Dino De Laurentiis and by Universal Studio, the biggest studio, to star in Conan the Barbarian. And after I did Conan the Barbarian, the director at the press conference said to the press, the director was John Milius. He said to the press, if we wouldn't have had Arnold, we would have had to build one. So think about that. The very body that they said can never be sold because the time is wrong. A few years later, I'm doing Conan the Barbarian and it was the number one hit at the box office when it came out in the summer of 82. Think about that, and the director says, if we wouldn't have had his body, we would have had to build one. So all of a sudden, my body became an asset, not a liability. And the same thing was with Terminator. After we were finished filming Terminator, Jim Cameron said to the press, if Arnold wouldn't have had that accent and talked like a machine, I think the movie wouldn't have worked. So think about that. The body and the accent that they attacked was an asset. But I didn't listen to those losers. I didn't listen to them at all. Because that's exactly the way it was in politics again when everyone said no, 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 and it can't be done. And then became governor of California. And this is with everything like that. This is just the reality of it, is, is that you cannot listen to the naysayers. So this is a very important lesson for all of you. I would have listened to the naysayers, from bodybuilding to show business to, the, uh, to uh, politics. I would not be standing here today, talking to you. I would be in Austria in the Alps, yodeling. That's right. I would be in Austria still left, yodeling. That's what I will be doing, exactly. So this is why I say don't listen to the naysayers. And the next thing, the third point that I'm gonna make to you is work your ass off. There is no magic bill. There is no magic out there. You cannot get around, you have to work and work and work, I can tell you, so it's work. And it drives me crazy when people say they don't have enough time to go to the gym for 45 minutes a day and work out. Or to do something for 45 minutes to an hour a day to improve. 
if it is physically improved or if it is mentally to improve. Imagine you read one hour a day about history. How much you will learn after 365 hours in one year. Think about if you study about the history of musicians, of composers, how much you would know. Imagine if you would work on the business, on some business that you want to develop every day for an hour. Imagine how further along you will go and get. So it drives me nuts because we have, when people say we don't have the time, we have 24 hours a day. We sleep six hours a day, so it gives you still 18 hours. So we have 18 hours a day, the average person works around eight to 10 hours. So let's assume it's 10 hours, so we have eight hours left. Then you travel around an hour a day, maybe two hours a day. So now you have still six hours left. So what do you do with the six hours? What do you do with the six hours? Then we eat a little bit, then we schmooze a little bit, talk a little bit to people and all that stuff. But you can see how much time there is available if you organize your day. So you got to work hard. I mean, let me tell you something, when I went to America, I went to college, I went and worked out five hours a day, and I was working on construction. Because in those days in bodybuilding, there was no money. We didn't, I didn't have the money for food supplements or anything. So I had to go to work. So I worked in construction. I went to college, I worked out in the gym and at night from eight o'clock at night to 12 midnight, I went to acting class four times a week. So I did all of that. There was not one single minute that I wasted. And this is why I'm standing here today. I became very friendly with Muhammad Ali in the 70s. And Muhammad Ali worked his butt off. And I saw it firsthand. And I remember that there was a sports rider that was there in the gym when he was working out and he was doing sit-ups. And they asked him, how many sit-ups do you do? And he said, I don't start counting until it hurts. Now think about that. He doesn't start counting his sit-ups until he feels pain. That's when he starts counting. That is working hard. And so you can't get around the hard work, it doesn't matter who it is. As a matter of fact, I believe what uh, Ted Turner said, work like hell and advertise. You get it? Work like hell. Go to bed and early, early to rise, work like hell and advertise. So you work your ass off and then you let the world know about your work. That's what it is all about. Let people know if you have a company, if you have a movie, if you do a sports, work your ass off, but then advertise and let everyone know.